everyone. Welcome back to Behind the Lens. We are here. For most of you out there, I think this may actually be spring break. Uh, the week before Easter and Passover start, day after Palm Sunday. Um, hopefully you're all enjoying yourselves, but at the same time, you can always listen to Behind the Lens on AdrenalineRadio.com. You can watch us on Facebook Live, although the camera up in the corner of the room is kind of sketchy. But, of course, that's a whole other issue. Um, it's just something that our beloved station manager, Nick Federoff, likes to do. So welcome. I am Debbie Elias, film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens, where we go behind the lens and below the line with film, television, music, stage, special events. Today, we've got kind of a potpourri of things for you. Um, we've got... Veteran actor John T. Woods joining us at the midpoint of the show to talk about his brand new film, film Dead Bullet, written and directed by Eric Reese. I have to say I was beyond pleasantly surprised by the film, by its construct, the fact that it is a character-driven thriller as opposed to an event-driven thriller. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking to John. Uh, you will... when. Uh, He's been around for quite a while. You've seen him in uh, co-starring roles on Criminal Minds, 24, CSI Miami, iCarly. Um, he's been around, and he just gets better and better. But then we've got a lot of pre-recorded exclusive interviews. I've been interviewing up a storm lately uh, because so many people, they're in the middle of shooting, they're in the middle of traveling, and it's tough to get them. Uh, on Mondays between 11 and 12 o'clock sometimes, uh, Pacific time, 2 and 3 Eastern time. Uh, but I think we've got a nice eclectic blend for you today uh, and hope I get that we get to a lot of this. I've got uh, four very talented people uh, we have pre-recorded interviews with today. Um, a wonderful pairing, writer-director Max Winkler and, of course, Zoe Deutsch uh, talking about their film, flower and I have to say it is one of the sweetest smelling indies uh, of the year and uh, with these two together everything is coming up roses pun intended um, also I spoke with Imelda Staunton about her new film which she co-stars with Timothy Spall, Celia Emery, Joanna Lumley um, Finding Your Feet it is incredible. It is not just for the ARP crowd. It is for every crowd. It is for the whole family. It is a delight, an absolute delight. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to Imelda's interview. But the first one, the first interview that you're going to get to hear this morning, uh, I just did yesterday with Greg Sestero. Many of you out there know of Greg and his work. Greg uh, was partner in crime with Tommy Wiseau some years ago with The Room. Greg then went on to write the book The Disaster Artist about the making of The Room. Uh, of course, The Disaster Artist was made into the much lauded film starring James Franco uh, as Tommy Wiseau uh, that uh, he received a Golden Globe uh, Award for and generated all kinds of awards and festival buzz the past couple of years. Um, Tommy and Greg have a new film. It is called Best Friends with the R in parenthesis. So you could take it to mean Best Fiends. Um, they were both at the Gasparilla Film Festival down in Tampa, Florida, where there was a screening of the film. I was supposed to speak with both of them, but Tommy headed out and went back to L.A., so I only got to talk to Greg yesterday. But since Greg is the writer of the film, as well as the co-lead playing opposite Tommy's character. Um, I think I got the better end of the deal, in all honesty, people. Um, Greg is articulate, he's passionate, and he really put so much thought into the subtext of this film, of which there is a part two that's coming. Now, let me give you the, the screening information uh, for all you Tommy Wiseau fans out there. Best Friends is screening on March 30th and April 2nd. It is a Fathom special event. So go to Fathom Events uh, on the Internet, type in your zip code, and you'll see what theaters. 
There are approximately 600 theaters nationwide in all the major markets and then some where the film will be playing March 30th and April 2. Then on June 1 and June 4, volume 2 of this film will come out, and I am already dying to see it after seeing volume 1. But it's it, the, the premise, it's a very interesting premise. Greg Sestero plays who we think is a homeless man named, mute named John. Uh, as we find out, he is not mute, but there are many layers to him. Tommy Wiseau plays a rather quirky and strange mortician named Harvey who likes to pull the gold out of the the teeth of um, his customers, shall we say. Uh, he also has a great propensity for old Hollywood and making every corpse look beautiful before the body passes into paradise. Um, production values of the film are outstanding. It was uh, cinematographer, director, and editor Justin McGregor. Beautiful, beautiful, high polish, great production values that really help enhance the detail of the production design um, that, re- that complements and really brings to life Greg's words and the thematics that he has going on in Best Friends. I have to say, I was completely surprised pleasantly so and I think all of you when you see the film and I can't encourage you enough highly enough to go see it uh on March 30th or April 2 I think you will also be very pleasantly surprised and entertained so without any further ado take a listen to my interview yesterday with Greg Sestero talking about best friends and or fiends Thanks so much for taking time to talk to me. It's just, when I watched your film, I'm so excited about it. I, oh, so I, I really like it, Greg. <laughs> the script, wow. uh, your script, it's creative. It's got some quirkiness to it, but you actually have these great themes running through the film that really give pause for thought about friendship, about kindness, about helping others, about screwing others over, about deceptions, fraud, all these great elements that really, in the third act, you really tie it all together with some great intrigue. I I am so, so, I was so excited to, to see this, this film. I'm so glad to hear that, you know, because it's like I said, I mean, I've always been a movie lover and I've always felt like, you know, you know, in the room, you kind of were part of something that was that was really out there and absurd, but it, you never really got a chance to make a film because people perceived you, you know, a certain way. And so, uh, you know, that was really the goal was to try really to go out and try it. Where did the idea for this story come from, Greg? This is not the kind of story where you're sitting at breakfast one day and think, hmm, I'm going to get a strange mortician that has, like, a Morticia Adams vibe going on, crossed with something else, and we're going to have a homeless guy who doesn't talk, but he really can talk, and we're going to be taking all the fillings out of dead people's teeth. I mean... Okay, so there's a few things. I, um, you know, I've been um, trying to write a TV show idea. I was, very, I was very much inspired by Breaking Bad and Fargo and kind of these small town uh, underground worlds. And, uh, you know, Nightcrawlers, a film that I really loved. Again, about a business that we don't know too much about. Um, and, and Drive as well, uh, another kind of L.A. story that, that takes place in a world we don't know too much about. So there's a couple things here, you know, based, being based on the true, on a true story. Uh, you know, my brother's a dentist, and uh, he told me about these, this world, you know, this, this business in the dental industry about, you know, with gold, the prices of gold rising tremendously, that there was a lot of work there, and a lot of, a lot of dentists ended up making good money doing this. Uh, on the side um, and 
And so with Tommy's character, I don't know, I sat down one night and I and Tommy to me has always been part vampire, part Joker. You know, I pictured if, if the Joker had a backstory, Tommy is very much fitting into this character, the way he walks, his charisma. And so I just sat down and I started writing out this this story of a uh, culmination of a lot of ideas that I've had. One of you know, I, you know, I, I love quirky comedies. I love bizarre films. Um, and so I just kind of started writing the story out, um, you know, with, with one of the inspirations also being the road trip that Tommy and I took years ago in which he thought I was plotting something against him to try to kill him or something. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of it was years of just kind of having things come together. And I sat down and the story just... Within four days, it all kind of came together, and I really enjoyed uh, working on it. I mean, it is just, and of course, Tommy's character, how much of that character was on the page, and how much did Tommy infuse? Well, I mean, having written The Disaster Artist, one of the things with The Disaster Artist that I really worked hard on was I wanted every line of dialogue in there to be true to something that Tommy had said or did say. And uh, I didn't want any made-up dialogue, any kind of exposition and trying to make him more of a character. I really wanted him to be real. And so I took the same approach with this film, and I wrote it in Tommy's mind and something he would say and something that he could express himself so his character would be somebody we could be interested in and relate to. Uh, so I, I pretty much pretty much stuck to the script. I mean, he threw in a few a few zingers here and there and then altered a few things. But for the most part, it was all scripted for the most part. And he, uh, you know, he infused a few things here and there, but he really, he really worked hard to learn the lines, to become the character. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a, it was a crazy experience. You know, now were you always writing the role of John for yourself? Uh, initially I had had a, you know, a couple, like a, a different uh, character in mind, like a different person in my mind as I was writing it. But when Tommy was like, well, why would you put somebody else in this part? I was like, oh, you're right. It's like it's time, you know, it's time for us to, to, to take this on together and do it together. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think I'm so glad that you did cast yourself in there because I really think you bring a lot more to John a lot more layers than another actor might have put into it because you were so intimately familiar with your creation? True, I, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, I'm, how happy are you with what Justin did, you know, DPing, directing, editing? Because I got to tell you, the production values on this film, Greg, are fabulous. The entire Mortician's Lab is stunning it is gleaming the polish of digital the i mean justin's framing and then all the production design that um kenneth mcgregor put into it absolutely stunning yeah we were lucky to i i you know i live in, in pasadena and where, where they film a lot of movies but they filmed back to the future and and uh, mad men and stuff and so luckily there was this set of this real life morgue autopsy only about three miles from where I was living in, um, you know, again, in kind of the, in a different part of L.A. One of, my, one of my things that I wanted to do with this is shoot L.A. in a way that we've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this lab was a real-life morgue autopsy place, and they, they built an identical set, movie set next door. So what we were working on is, is a space that's virtually identical to where they were. Wow! Right, right near us, so we could really inhabit. And uh, and one of the great things about working with Justin is we both have a love of film, and we both have a love of like kind of the noir feel of, of, of a movie. And we thought how cool it would be to to make a film shot well and give a totally different totally different experience to fans of the room uh, with a film that it really has an aesthetic that uh, we haven't seen and so we, we were both you know ambitious with the idea to really take on this challenge of making you know a legit film uh with tommy as the lead and a character that suits him and so yeah working with justin was really terrific because we both you know kind of live and breathe film and we're willing to just go all, all the way 
uh, but we just work as hard as we could to try to make something we were proud of. Well, and of course, your love of film and your knowledge of, of the golden age of Hollywood comes through loud and clear with the Black Dahlia references, with all of the the classic Hollywood icons displayed on the shelf, and then the cars that are act, that are used in the film. I mean, right away, it's like I knew you understood noir and the golden age of Hollywood, and you really brought that in. Also, I don't know what's coming in volume two of this, <laughs> but I keep thinking, it's like, oh my God, okay, Harvey's not really dead. Harvey's been making death masks for centuries. Harvey just keeps putting a new face on himself. Um, my mind is reeling with what you're doing with volume two. <laughs> I gotta tell you. <laughs> I mean, you did that. Yeah. You did that well, creating this film and setting it up for volume two. You planted the seeds already. Yeah, we. I mean, we shot basically both movies without even realizing it. I, you know, the script was was basically seen as one film, uh, and we shot everything, and we realized there's two films here, and and. We were sitting on something really kind of cool and unique with part two of what we could do. And uh, and I'm really glad that we kind of let both films breathe because there's so many cool things to do uh, in part two. And there's so many so many ways the story can, can come alive that I didn't initially see. So um, I'm most excited about part two personally because you're really able to kind of now develop things. Uh, from part one in a way that I think will surprise people. And that's what I am so excited about because you really did plant all these great things like the Black Dahlia obsession. Look at newspaper clippings of the mortician, you know, and the weird things that he did and the criminal charges. So we have all of this planted. But then what? something that you did here also that I really appreciated, you added touches of humor. It's like when you open the ATM and there's lemons sitting in there, immediately, it's like, okay, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. It's like a final, almost a f*** you from Harvey to John. It's like, I told you, I told you, money's not what's important. I mean, that the metaphor and the references you insert, just so thoughtfully done, Greg. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, like I said, it was, um, you know, when, the, when material is, is close to you, and it's personal to you, um, you just really hope that people take it the right way. And I learned with the book, you know, if you try to, and even if something's not perfect, you know, if you, if you really are authentic and put your heart into something, you know, I, I feel like it'll affect people hopefully in the right way. Now, I know that Volume 1 is going to screen on March 30th and April 2. Do you know what the what the screening format's going to be, how many cities that's going to be in, or is it going to be... It's going to be in cities nationwide. It's going to be in about 600 theaters. It's on the Fathom Events website. You can type oh, in your, okay. your zip code, and you can see, you know, screenings where they're playing near you. But it's playing in, in you know, in every major city and state. And then Volume 2 on June 1 and 4 will do the same thing. Correct. Because I have to get a ticket because I have to see it. Uh, it there's, <laughs> there's just no getting around that. What was the most challenging part of bringing this story to life? Um, I think it was just, uh, it was really everything. I feel like from day one, you know, making a film, there's huge challenges, and this one was the same thing. It was, um, you know, there's a lot of ambitious ideas in there and, uh, you know, obviously getting Tommy to play this character in a way that we would really believe him. Mm -hmm. um, making sure the scenes were, were shot in a way that weren't, you know, captured as kind of a goofy joke and, then, and really try to get performances and really try to tell a story and, you know, getting the shots of L.A., getting... The, I mean, there's so many locations in this movie. Yeah. There's like 15, 20 locations. Oh, we shot in Malibu, we shot Big Sur... Uh, all over LA, um, so it was just kind of keeping your your passion up through uh, through the grind of making each one of these scenes happen, and not only happen, but in a way that people would hopefully believe them. Mm -hmm. What is it? I'm curious. So for you, you know, after the room, what is it that has kept you going? What is the gift that writing and acting gives you that has kept you going all this time? to now finally 
deliver this great film? Um, I, you know what? It's just my love for, for movie making. I think, um, you know, The Room, I think a lot of people assume, like, oh, man, you must regret doing The Room. But really, in a lot of ways, The Room kept my dream alive because the re- with the way that The Room ended up becoming a cult classic and people started seeing it, you know, it gave me the opportunity to write the book and the book, you know, the disaster artist changed everything for me because it really brought me back in touch with my love for storytelling. And I think if you love to tell stories, you can do that anywhere and no one can take that away from you. You know, acting, you got to get cast in things. You got to please other people's vision of what they want. But with, with writing, you can create a world and you can do it anywhere. And so I learned a lot to writing the disaster artist. You know, and, and, and I learned a lot about collaboration. I got to, to write with uh, my co-author, Tom Bissell, who taught me a lot about uh, writing and creating. And um, and it just gave me a confidence that, you know, it's okay to try, even if you're not winning Oscars or whatever. You're still you're still trying. You're still creating. And I, and I realized over the past year that being on set with this movie, we're in collaborating with, with a team of people and making a film was, was such such a rewarding, amazing experience. Um, and now that was enough. It wasn't even about like, oh, is it make a hundred million dollars? Does it does it come out? It's it's really the reward of of of, of writing and, and and creating and working with people that I felt like was hugely rewarding. And so that's what's really kept me going is just the challenge of uh, of doing exactly that. And I have to say, I can think of a few filmmakers right now that need to really listen to what Greg was saying. It's not about the awards. Um, A word of advice to filmmakers out there. You know, there were some unpleasant experiences with some talent over the past weekend. Um, Filmmakers, especially new filmmakers, first time directors, when you, a, a bit of advice for you. When you were invited to participate in a film festival, when your film is accepted, when they are paying your airfare, your hotel bills, do not get in a snit and throw a hissy fit and not show up because you're not getting an award. As Greg so beautifully put it, it's not about the awards. It's about the art. It's about the collaboration. That's the joy and passion. That's why you become a filmmaker, to tell your story, to collaborate, to create It is not about the awards. So that is my small soapbox speech today for filmmakers out there. Um, You know, be thankful, be happy. And, hey, if you're getting free airfare and hotel somewhere, you go. That's (laughs) that's my thinking. (laughs) So, again, Best Friends, Fathom Event, March 30th, April 2. See it, see it. Yes, there are some, obviously, some adjustments that could be made to the film, but this is a solid feature film with some great themes in it, underlying themes and subtext, and I really think you'll enjoy it. Plus, it's always fun to see Tommy Wiseau on screen doing something, and he's doing lots of things in Best Friends. But now, let's switch gears for a few minutes. We're only going to get to hear... A portion of this interview with Max Winkler and Zoe Deutsch uh, before John T. Woods calls in. Um, the film is Flower. It is, I love this film. I've mentioned it for a few weeks now. Uh, it is in theaters now. It was in three theaters last week. Had an over 19,000 per screen average, which is amazing. It has expanded this week into even more theaters. Um, There's no excuse not to see it. It's directed by Max Winkler, co-written by Max, Max Matt Spicer, and Alex McCauley. Stars Zoe Deutsch, Joey Morgan, Catherine Hahn, Adam Scott, Tim Heidecker, Eric Edelstein. Eric's been on the show before. Big shout out to Eric, who is wonderful as Officer Dale in Flower. Um, And it is just, it's an incredible story. Focuses on Zoe's character of Erica a teen coming of age, but coming of age in a very dysfunctional family with a lot of, she is a girl with a lot of chutzpah, a lot of bravura that covers up a lot of insecurity. Zoe is masterful in this role. That's all I can say. She is masterful. 
uh, with her performance. Those of you who were lucky enough to see her last, late last year, Rebel in the Rye that Danny Strong directed, where she played Una O'Neill, or The Year of Spectacular Men, which her mother directed. Um, Zoe is amazing. She's chameleonic. She has depth. She has texture. And after an intimate roundtable, Max and Zoe and I sat down for a, a three-on-one uh, to talk about the making of flour and certain specifics in the process. So here, we'll, take, we'll start to take a listen now. Or should we just do the other clip, Pam? Do the short clip. All right. We're going to do the short clip first from the roundtable where... You will hear the opening of the film. I hope this word is allowed to be said on the air. No, we better go with the other clip. <laughs> Just occurred to me. Um, yeah, so let's t- let's start to take a listen, and then we'll come back to and complete the interview later on in the show if we have time. Max Winkler and Zoe Deutsch. Production values. Yeah. No, but it's because of everyone. The, the crew is amazing. Well, all women. Carolina. She's a goddess. Your cinematography, this is what I yeah, love seeing. Right. Because after seeing okay. the ceremony, and I know you've been doing a lot of television in between, how the growth in your yeah. eye and your storytelling from ceremony to right. now is fabulous. Thank you. We really just, like, Carolina and I just wanted to make it only about the actors and, and only about her face and her energy. And any time there was... I would be over-caffeinated and start wanting to show off or start talking about boogie nights, I would immediately, she was, she had strict orders. This is why it's important to work with women. She would cut me off immediately and say, that's not our plan. So I told her while we were watching these movies, whether it was 400 Blows or Christian F or uh, Rat Catcher or Fish Tank, I was like, it needs to feel as truthful as these. There can be no male showing off, and it needs to only be about her. And we have to do her justice and capture her. And I you, felt you grateful look, to have her. Carolina account. has you lit so beautifully. Someone just screen. told me that yesterday. They were like, I can't believe how pretty all of the women look and yeah, how good you look. It's, Carolina is such a gifted cinematographer. And also, I think my, 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 one of my favorite parts about shooting this movie was that it was so. The freedom to move was so awesome. It wasn't. Here's the shot. Here's where I this side of the room mm-hmm. I've lit. Let's go well, there. Only, it was light the rooms and then the actors because when you have a character like Erica played by someone like Zoe, the energy is so palpable to to have them relegated to specific marks. Which is it just wasn't that kind of yeah. movie. Whereas Ceremony was like a very screwball comedy, like rhythm based mm-hmm. thing, and this was the opposite and undoing all of that stuff. And to me, it would be such a disservice to. Imagine if that first scene, the first day Catherine and Zoe met on the bed, if we were like, mm, can you guys separate? Can you be further apart? It would completely demean the talent of the actors to immediately entangle their yeah. legs and arms and pick at their skin and hair. And and we wanted that. And so Carolina, you know, this is also shooting seven to eight to nine pages mm-hmm. a day. And the fact that she did that is... Really impressive. Well, I, have I think the s- fact that you... Sorry, I interrupted you. you oh, go ahead. no, go. I was going to say that having seen you, having seen what Danny did with you with Rebel, I have to say, you look so glorious and gorgeous as Una O'Neill. <laughs> she does. You look like a George Harrell portrait in that <laughs> Thank film. Thank you. Danny Thank knows. You. I told Danny. And, <laughs> and I mean, great just stunning. But to see the contrast of what your mom did with you with the cinematography in Spectacular Men, what Max has done here... Your mom went for more saturation, a little harsher light. You went much softer. Right. More natural. You look beautiful in both, but I have to say, I love how he has you done over what Leah did. Oh, all right. Well, they're very different characters. They're very Very different movies. They're very, I mean, Flower is a dark comedy, whereas Your Spectacular Man is a romantic comedy. And you, I think what's important, um, I'm not a cinematographer. I don't know how, I don't know what goes into that but I think you need to shoot you need to shoot the movie not you know shoot what you want to shoot it needs to be uh, appropriate to the to the text and I think Carolina did a really beautiful job uh, with that for this film pull all of your all of the shots of yourself out of there and put that in your book those can be your headshots for the rest of your (laughs) I couldn't believe 
how she pops out of the screen. It's it's really we just had a screening and everyone couldn't believe like that she's like a normal sized twenty two year old. Like it just everyone's like she's so little like because you seem so big on screen because your personality <laughs> of that character is so mm-hmm. affecting. And I think it was Nancy Meyer. She like couldn't believe that you're like a twenty two year old person, twenty three year old person that just like is a girl. You it really is like. To me, you feel that's what separates great actors and movie stars, not to toot your own horn, which is in a way tooting mine, but I just think, like, it's that thing that when you're the camera's on you, there's just an extra magic that comes out mm-hmm. that I feel like, great to see you, that I feel like Zoe had in her self-tape in her hotel room. Mm-hmm. I, that, that's what I saw in the, the hotel room. I was like, this movie is so tiny in some degrees because with the money and the schedule and what we have and to, to carry a movie the, the burden and the weight of carrying a movie and being in every scene and is exhausting mm-hmm. and hard and a lot of great actors can't do it um, because it, of the task mm-hmm. and it, that, that was never our issue in editing mm-hmm. or our issue with like, Zoe's performance was always like the North Star to cut back to if something wasn't working. Mm-hmm. It was always, yeah. You know, um. and that's just a part of my lengthy interview with Max Winkler and Zoe Deutsch. And yes, for those of you that are wondering, Max Winkler is in fact the son of the Fonz himself, Henry Winkler. Zoe is the daughter of director Howard Deutsch. Leah Thompson, her sister Maddie is a, is a musician, a writer, an actress, a very talented family, shall we say. Well, somebody else who's very talented who is joining us right now live, I am thrilled to welcome John Woods to the show. Hi, John. Hey, Debbie. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Oh, I am so thrilled to have you. I was so excited when Tim hit me up and said, hey, you want to have John on the show? He's got a new film out. Tim is a hell of a guy, isn't he? Tim is an amazing guy. <laughs> he really is. And, of course, I mean, I recognize your work from so many things over the years. And I'm so excited because in the past few years, we're really starting to see you tackle. You're the leading man in this past bunch of films that you've been doing and that are yet to come. I mean, right now... D- yeah, that's true. And it's it's been a haul for you. I mean, but you've presented solid performances. Uh, I know you do a lot of theater also, but uh, mm-hmm. not as many people go to the theater as watch shows like 24 or Criminal Minds. And there you this are. Is true. And you've steadily been building up your resume and your experience over the years. So now you are carrying these films. And I've got to say, Dead Bullet truly blew me away. I didn't know what to expect. I thought it would be, you know, one of your, you know, a regular thriller, you know, you know, we got a heist going on, things like that. But this is really, it's character driven as opposed to event driven. And it's because of a great, some great direction by Eric Reese with his pacing and letting the intrigue and suspense build from the performance or just the stillness. Because you got a lot of scenes where you're shaking in your boots and you're not moving because of a circumstance. But it's that mm. hesitancy and that state that you bring to the character of Bill Holden that really just pulls you into this film. Well, that's, yeah, that's... um. Definitely all Eric Reese. <laughs> He's a, it's definitely his sensibility to stew in the moment and uh, really let it breathe and let the audience, uh, you know, feel what our main character is feeling. And, uh, yeah, I, I, that's a, one of the reasons I really love working, working with Eric. Uh, he has a really good sensibility for storytelling. Well, and, of course, this is not to put it down by any way, shape, or form, but this is quite different than some of your work in films like Zombie Strippers. Um, yeah, quite, <laughs> quite different. <laughs> uh, yeah, I look, I look, you know, it's funny. 
Debbie, I look back and, you know, I can think about, and I, right now, to be perfectly honest, I'm laying down looking at the ceiling because I'm recovering from spine surgery. Oh, my God. And I, yeah, I, you know, and I, you have no, you know, no choice but to reflect on the last 20, 25 years of your life. And I remember projects like uh, Zombie Strippers, hell of, a, hell of a Good Time, and everything I've done over the years. And uh, I'm proud of every single thing that I've done. And I, and I think back, and I, it's kind of like you said, I'm happy with the trajectory things are taking. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and it, it's funny because I think about, you know, I just spoke with Greg Sestero yesterday, and I played uh-huh. our interview er- earlier in the show. And, you know, Greg had to live down the room with Tommy Wiseau um, for yeah. years. And he's very reflective on it and he gave it a lot of thought. And it's like, I don't regret doing it because I learned so much and it made me keep going, you know, to get yeah, better. I have zero, zero regrets. I, you know, I, I sort of secretly love the crap that I get from hometown friends up in Portland, Oregon <laughs> about things that I do. And <laughs> it's charming that when they uh, have opinions about that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, everything I look back on, It's the same thing as working regular money jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, You might have a job that you're working at that you hate, but after a year of working there, you've met somebody who got you to the next job, Mm -hmm. and you may not like that job very much, but it got you to the next job. So you look back on all those jobs, very thankful that you had them. And, of course, you got your rent paid in the meantime, too. Indeed. It makes <laughs> it makes all the difference, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, so to give everybody a sense of how would you, dis- give me a synopsis of Dead Bullet. How was, how did, did Eric and the producers, how did they approach you with a synopsis of what this film is? Because that's an interesting title, actually. Yeah, it's, um, the, the actual story of it is it's about a, a gambler who is from a very small town and uh, one of these guys who's got nothing really going on in life, but he comes into some stolen casino chips and decides he wants to sell them to one of these big baddies who is in the, you know, crime world. And uh, of course it doesn't really go as planned. Everything sort of goes South real quick. Uh, Talking with Eric about the part when he mentioned, uh, you know, playing, playing Bill Holden, he, he and I really quickly recognized the sort of vulnerability, I think, that Bill Holden had to have. And it's tough when you have a leading character in a, in a thriller that isn't always able to, you know, overpower everybody or shoot everybody or do whatever they need to do. A guy who's very vulnerable and um, sort of a victim. Uh, on and off of, of circumstance, mm-hmm. even though he created those circumstances. I was going to say, yeah, but, um, he's yeah. a victim of himself in many respects. Sincerely. Yeah, yeah. sincerely. And then the cast itself is, I mean, I'm blown away. Uh, I got to see the film in the theaters when it was doing its theatrical run. And, you know, I mean, everybody is so, you know, Andrea Sixtos, Jose, um, Rosetta, uh Ray Trickett, the, the other, the, this, the ensemble cast. It's a great ensemble cast, I think. It really is. And, you know, Ray Trickett is another one we have seen around for quite a while and generally in a not-so-nice role. Um, and he, yeah. And his Dirty Dick, he is definitely not-so-nice uh, in Dead Boy. Yeah, he's a real piece of junk. <laughs> you know, what I, find okay. it, what I find interesting about the character of Bill and what you really bring to him is the moral ambiguity, his uncertainty in certain situations that goes beyond vulnerability, but uncertainty Mm -hmm. and, like, trying to put on some bravura for himself more than anyone else. Um, But then he does have a conscience in there. And do you do the right thing? Do you take the money and run? Of course, we find out eventually why he wanted the money. Um, yeah, which on selfish on one hand actually was sweet and charming on the other hand. So you really play with these emotions and the ambiguous nature of everything colliding. And it's, it's really interesting to watch you on screen in character 
coming to terms with all of these things in various situations? Well, I think it's, uh, it, it's something that we deal with every day as humans, but especially in this business that you and I are in mm-hmm. and uh, my contemporaries, is there's this sort of sense of creating a narrative um, that you kind of have to let yourself believe about yourself, about what you do in life, about your career, about your ambitions, your dreams, Mm -hmm. that if you don't, uh, it becomes incredibly depressing, (laughs) your set of circumstances. You really have to, uh, I mean, it's the whole thing of, you know, keep, keep dreaming, keep, you know, thinking big. And I think Bill has this idea in his head of um, perfect life, a perfect scenario, and why he doesn't go about it the normal way, you know, um, speaks a lot to his, to his character, mm-hmm. you know, that he isn't, um, he isn't someone that can go, that can play by the rules, I, I suppose. And, uh, it's, it's sort of like, like a lot of us uh, tired of being poked in the eye by life mm-hmm. and by our circumstances and just kind of wants to fight back. You know, what do you as an actor do, you know, how do you get into that specific mindset for a character like Bill? Because this, you know, sometimes this one is yeah. Go more, ahead. This one is more mindset than the physicality of it. I mean, granted, there is yeah. Bill does. There's quite a few fight scenes, and there are some you know scenes out in the desert, which we'll get into in, in a minute here. Um, uh, that, <laughs> that's brutal enough filming out in the desert. Um, but I'm curious how you get into the mindset of a character like this to consistently convey this throughout the shoot do you take this home with you once you find that that niche or you know is it something you can pick up and drop or does it take you a while to get there it's a really good question um i think in the case of dead bullet what was really nice about um working on this production which is produced by the sabi uh company Mm -hmm. a, a team of artists that made made features in the past and it was made in this sort of um, very tight-knit, familiar way where we went on site in Laughlin and uh, Bullhead City, Arizona, and we basically just lived in uh, rented houses, you know, side by side, and lived on there for about a month. So to take, to take it home with me every night was not difficult because it was mm-hmm. early mornings and it was late nights. So it was actually really just hard to let go of. Wow. Because uh, Bill Holden was always tired and... John T. Woods was always tired <laughs> doing it. So every day it's kind of easy to walk back in in my filthy clothes and go, here we go again. And like you had mentioned, going out into the desert's a real um, kick in the face, uh, oh. shooting out there all day. I wouldn't have it any other way, though. I mean, I'm one of the luckiest people that I know. I mean, you for this, you have to do it on location. You could not have done yeah. a film like this anywhere but. You really need the desolation and isolation of that landscape for this Absolutely. film. It's like Eric had said, that Laughlin and Bullhead City were both a character mm-hmm. in the piece. Mm-hmm. And you even got to play, yeah, with, and, and you got to play with little burrows, too. Oh, I know. It's a great, <laughs> great little city, great little town called Oatman, and it's like an hour away, and it, it just lives like that. It's on Route 66. Mm-hmm. So basically, people just drive through it all the time, and they they sell things and do like old western photos and stuff. What a cool little town! And do you got to get paid to go there? Look at that! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's the thing. You know, I've been doing this for so long, and it it wasn't what I started out doing. I started out in computer science, mm-hmm. and I just sort of transitioned into doing this. And then it comes there comes a time when you look back and you go, well. I've been sailing away from the land for so long, and now you look back and the land's no longer there. And mm-hmm. you think, well, I guess I'm just doing this now until I die from it. Mm-hmm. Or until something so I'm, else. I'm in this. <laughs> You're in this for the long haul. Now, you said you got, yeah. to, you got to see this on the big screen. You got to see it finished. I've got to ask you, um, your cinematographer on this, John Nitschke, oh, this lensing. Oh, Josh. Josh is gorgeous. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. Did you have any idea when you were shooting this 
that it really would look as good as it does, especially out in the in the vistas in the desolation. Yeah, um, I can say that honestly, I, I would because Josh is incredibly talented and much like me, he's a uh, super detail oriented. Mm-hmm. And um, when we shoot things, I knew that we weren't going to move on until he had it, you know, looking breathtaking. And uh, he's also an incredibly accomplished photographer as well, just mm-hmm. still photographer. Well, and, I mean, uh, Josh is very technical, so. And I'm not surprised you're saying that he's an accomplished still photographer because so many of the images, especially the way he holds shots and lingers on the faces. Uh, yeah. You know, that's so much a uh, part of still photography is capturing the face. Oh, so much. Capturing the look. Yeah, he, he does that. He, he, frames, um, he frames folks really well, which at the same time goes along really well with Eric's sensibilities of storytelling and the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. So it's all a, a nice little, they're, they're a good pairing, those two, a good team. I mean, it's, a, I mean, all around on this, but really starting with Eric's story and then, you know, because he's, it's not what you expect. It's not event driven. It's character driven. It's driven by Bill mm. and what's running through Bill's head as opposed to, you know, specific events that are happening. Um, Bill set so well, much. That's of what draws me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what's so fascinating about this. And you really feel all the tension throughout the film. I mean, this could, it has as much tension, if not more than a Liam Neeson thriller. where he's I know exactly what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, now, I mean, sitting there holding your breath while you're watching it, so. Absolutely, especially some of the moments where we don't see anyone, but we know that you're there. We just don't know where mm-hmm. you are. Um, but, of course, I have to say, I mean... Bill got sloppy there, leaving his keys out in the open in one scene. Sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. He 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 should have put him in. Look, his he's pocket. not a professional. <laughs> <laughs> we learned that very he's quickly. Prof- he's not a professional scumbag. He's a, a an amateur scumbag. But he's a likable one. That's just it. Bill's very, yeah. Bill is very. He's a very likable character. And and you also don't, yeah. you don't see that too often in a thriller either. Uh, you know, some no, uh, some, no, you don't. Uh, so, that's another thing that really sets Dead Bullet apart. Now, you've also got coming out either Crossbreed is out now. That just came out, correct? That's not close. close. We're right on the verge of now, that one. Now, I know Dead Bullet is now on VOD, I believe. So people can yeah, it's on. It did a theatrical run nationwide. It's uh, VOD. It's on iTunes. Um, so, Amazon can be ordered as well. So everyone can see that. But then you've got crossbreed that is imminent. Then you've got yes. now. What about uh, West Virginia stories? Is that is that? Those are the two. Yeah, those are the two that are right on the verge. And I shot all of these, man, sort of around the same time. And uh, I'm very excited, really, about both of these, about West Virginia stories and crossbreed coming out because crossbreed's a sci-fi movie. West Virginia Stories is a very character-driven um, small-town story. Oh. So um, they're both very different. Crossbreed should be a hell of a lot of fun. It's with Vivica A. Fox. Oh, God. And uh, da- <laughs> Daniel Baldwin. So she plays the president, the first African-American female president in film. So that's exciting. And I can just imagine her relishing that role. Oh, yeah. Just... uh Chewing the scenery, eating it up. She was great, uh, fantastic. So, so, and now, what is? Can you talk about what the premise is for Crossbreed then, and what your character is in that one? Sure. Well, you know, I'm 38, and what's great about um, this movie itself is the writers, uh, Robert and Brandon, uh, Robert Thompson and Brandon Slagle. Mm-hmm. Brandon also directed it. Okay. But they're both, you know, of the same era as me, and so we grew up playing, going to the arcade, playing video games, things like that, Nintendo. And so this is a very much like a kind of a love letter to the old alien games we used to play, like Contra 
and Rebel and Trojan and all these different ones that were on Nintendo. So it's very much a fun, you know, uh, tongue-in-cheek throwback sci-fi movie. So I think that's the vibe that they're, they're going for, but it's about a team that is sent up to a government base and uh, to retrieve a bioweapon from this uh, research facility. Basically stop bad aliens from coming to Earth. That's the idea. Well, obviously, and Vivica A. Fox is right at home in this one, then. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's faced off with aliens before, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, man. And what about West Virginia Stories? Well, um, West Virginia Stories is cool, because it's, it's, it, when I first got hired for that, and um, went out to West Virginia, a small town called Davis, where the filmmakers are actually from. We, I read the, I read the script, and I realized it's very like Coen Brothers esque. It's got like, it's got three intertwining tales that uh, going on at you know different places, different times, but they're all tied together mm-hmm. um, through the same that's the same circumstances. And this one's very character driven. I'm I'm super proud of it, and uh, it's played festivals and, and got distribution uh, right away um i'm really proud of that entire team of people and my friend peter um peter van norden he's also in the in the movie as well he plays the local mayor of the uh of the movie and he's a, a veteran actor and he's been around forever um and he's he's great he's been doing tons of theater and stuff anyway west virginia stories is going to be coming out soon from what i hear so west virginia stories and crossbreed are both right on the verge so now what I find really interesting is that for the, long, for the longest time with your TV work, we're seeing the same kind of mm-hmm. genres popping up, CSI Miami, Criminal Minds, 24, yeah. things along those lines. Now that you have stepped into this leading man uh, casting with this whole batch of films, you've got Dead Bullet, which is a thriller, Crossbreed, Sci-Fi, mm-hmm. West Virginia Stories, a character-driven drama. You're really you're trying to change things up here and really tap into different genres. Conscious decision, um, comfortable, or you know, what's what's the thought process there? I love I love that question because it's something that people ask very seldom, but I have a an answer for it. For the longest time when I first moved to Los Angeles, which was before people had internet in their houses or people carried cell phones. I thought for sure that I was going to fit into the half hour comedy, the world, like I'll be the wacky neighbor because that's how I feel inside. (laughs) And then when I I started going, I wasn't getting anything. It wasn't working. And then I realized that I sort of have this blue collar chip on my shoulder Mm -hmm. that probably comes from my dad. And that I have this sort of, um, intensity i think that comes off on on camera and so i started getting cast in these one hour dramas dark blue 24 ncis all those and i realized oh it doesn't really matter how you see yourself in this business it 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 matters what you portray how you come off and so i started to really embrace that um well how people saw me and started really leaning towards that leading man stuff uh action stuff really emotional uh, roles, being able to run the gamut of emotions, and that's where I'm most comfortable. Mm. I'm most comfortable carrying a film. I, that's where I feel completely at home is at the helm, and that's um, it's a comforting thing to say because I know a lot of people would say, "I'd love to be a lead in a film and things like that," but it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work to carry the film and keep the attitude up for you know every day on set and try to set an example of how the how the on set uh, morale should go. But I, I feel very comfortable in that position, and I feel very thankful to get to work with people uh, in this business. You know, I'm, I'm curious, um, with regard to Dead Bullet, and actually with any film, but most particularly Dead Bullet, um, when you're in situations, you're working opposite Ray Trickett, Jose Rossetti, the, you know, antagonist, you're essentially a protagonist, um, antagonist, how do you go about developing the very contentious and physically contentious dynamic in your relationships with characters like that? 
with the actors who, as you said, you're all living in houses next to each other, you know, for a month. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, a really good question. And it's, it doesn't always work uh, as easily as it did with Jose and Ray. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when you work with guys or with folks that have been around for a long time doing this work, what's so nice is you can show up on day one, shake hands, hey, man, good to see you, good to meet you, and go right into it like a light switch. Mm-hmm. And just know, okay, he's my number one enemy. I, you know, need to stand up to him and Jose saying, all right, He's my obstacle. I need to destroy him. And there's no buildup. We don't need to take days to get there. You just do the work right away. Mm-hmm. And uh, in this day and age, too, with such big budgets and uh, a lack of being able to take your time with takes, being able to get to the next scene within two or three takes, that's important um, these days. It's nice to take your time, for sure, and you have to be able to. But I think in order to work and in order to get to keep getting hired, you have to be someone that can be counted on to just turn that stuff on emotionally. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing when it comes to romantic on-screen stuff. You just realize you're professionals, and here we are. Let's yeah. not dilly-dally around it. Let's, let's click. There's a reason that, you know, that people get cast opposite each other, too, because they have that in-audition, in-callback chemistry to either be emotionally attached or very good as a protagonist, antagonist. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of that happens in the casting process where you realize, ah, these are going to be good people to face up against each other because they're going to be able to turn it on quickly. Mm-hmm. Do you think that your theater work has helped prepare you for that le- for just what you're saying here about stepping into the leading man role but be able- being able to turn it on and off very quickly? Because in theater, it's there, it's live, that's it. You don't get a second take. Yeah, there's so many um, positives to theater, and there's so many positives to film. Like, for example, the idea of, uh, I, I loved the idea of doing a stage production and reading the first critique and the first reviews that came out, because while I wouldn't change the foundation of my performance, I was able to sort of tweak things mm-hmm. as, as I went. And it's like my mom always described a uh, the theater as one of those zen water painting things you keep on your desk Mm -hmm. where each performance is like one of those paintings and then in five minutes it dries and you're never going to see it again and i think that's what's sort of beautiful about theater is that the audience comes in they're there they see the performance it's never ever ever going to be like that again and they get to experience it but the same thing for film is it exists forever uh, and and I don't know. It's it's sort of the 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 opposite of theater, but beautiful in its in its own way. Mm-hmm. And I like the, to answer your question. I've always liked the idea of being in this career and being able to turn it on, turn it off quickly. I don't necessarily. I don't think I have the time really to live in these emotions day in day out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got things I got to do, people to take care of, and dogs to feed. <laughs> so, yeah, um, like, I, I don't know if I can come home and lay that on them. Um, so now who's feeding the dogs while you're laid up after your spine surgery? Uh, that's a good question. That would be my fiance, Katie. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, and what's great is the dogs are very good at just laying with me. So, oh, God bless them. look at that. So how long before you're back yeah. up on your feet again and back in front of the camera? I'm told... Well, I'm told uh, the recovery is three months, and I'm like, I'm like one month in. So I'm thinking like June, I'm going to be back in fighting, fighting order. But I'm I'm already uh, going in for meetings and auditions right now. I'm oh, just uh, of course you are moving a bit slow. Yeah, <laughs> I can't I can't slow down. It's hard. <laughs> well, John, I can't thank you enough for for joining me today. This is this has been so much fun. This, I mean, it, this is fabulous having you on the show. I hope you will come back on the show as when Crossbreed and West Virginia Stories come out, so we can talk. Debbie, more about absolutely. Those. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's really really nice talking to you. You have fantastic questions and really good things to talk about. Oh well, I owe Tim for this one. I owe Tim big. For hooking us up here, John. <laughs> well, again, we both agree that uh, Tim is an amazing dude. 
<laughs> Tim is amazing. John, thank you so much. And everyone, Dead Bullet on VOD, iTunes, Amazon. Now see it. And I will Thanks, everyone, for checking it out. And I will talk to you again soon, John. Thanks, Deb. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was John T. Woods, Dead Bullet, out now, VOD, iTunes, Amazon. See it. It is a thriller. It's, once again, the game is stepped up. It's something different in a well-known genre. That's all the time we have today. Uh, the Max Winkler, Zoe Deutsch interview will be up on BehindTheLensOnline.net uh, sometime this week, along with some other things. Hopefully, we'll get to more of Zoe and Max next week in Imelda, along with Pat Mills is joining us live to talk about Don't Talk About Irene. Uh, until then, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens. Thank <laughs> you.